Okay, welcome to part C of lecture seven. We've made it. We've made it to paper money. Paper money is here, and it begins in China. Now, we left off in lecture, or in part B of lecture seven with the Song Dynasty, and I know that the Song Dynasty is producing a record number of cash coins, six billion a year, so that they actually had to decrease slightly the amount of copper in those coins and they're dealing with a severe copper shortage merchants are as they were under the tang dynasty still issuing paper bills redeemable in cash coin for long distance trade this so-called flying cash is mostly limited for mercantile use it doesn't circulate far and wide as uh, commonly among among the population but among a very select few through uh, and the uh, notes are created through woodblock printing the song dynasty gets it in its head to go ahead and take over that emission of paper notes issue government issue or emit government issued paper money also redeemable in cash coins but this time issued by the government and in far greater quantities so that not only merchants but also ordinary people can use paper currency and this currency they call Zhao Zi, Zhao Zi which uh, also means dumpling but in this uh, context Zhao Zi was the name for the first government issued paper money. And I think we can actually say the first truly paper currency. The fly, flying cash was a paper bill. It, it was a representative money, but the circulation was so limited, uh, perhaps we could make a, a fairly sound argument that the dawn of paper currency proper actually is found in the the 11th century under the Song Dynasty. And this too is a representative money for now. And they had different denominations for uh, various amounts of, of strings of cash, but Song Dynasty is issuing just uh, uh, tons of these uh, new paper notes. By the 12th century, there's as many as, uh, there are notes amounts to as many as 26 million strings of cash 26 million strings of cash remember a string of cash is 1000 cash coins so that's 26 billion cash coins worth of paper money that's in the system this caused some problem with inflation there was a temptation to, to print too much of this of this currency that couldn't maybe quite adequately be backed up by uh, the cash coins that it that it claimed to represent nevertheless um, it retains much of its value through through uh, through most of this period and is uh, again the world's truly first uh, uh, first excuse me first truly paper currency well word of the Chinese adoption of paper currency is going to travel west that silk road um, news traveled more slowly in those days of course but news traveled uh indeed and it wasn't long before people elsewhere began uh hearing about this chinese experiment well in the latter half of the 13th century the song dynasty falls and they fall to the mongol empire in some ways, the first half of this history of money course is, is not unlike a, a very, very brief overview or survey of world history itself. But there's the Mongol Empire at its height. And you'll notice, wow, just, I mean, right there on the doorstep of Europe, totally took over China, the Middle East, all of Central Asia, dominated the Silk Road. Actually, uh, some historians have argued that the Mongol Empire was 
very good and beneficial for trade because the Silk Road fell under the purview of a single power instead of being divided up between all these different competing governments and powers. It fell under one single power for for a good period in this in this uh, uh, high uh, in the this what we're no longer in the early medieval period. We're in the Middle Ages by the 13th century. And the uh, ruler, well, in this Mongol Empire, it was subdivided into different regions governed by various Mongol rulers. There was a Mongol ruler in Persia, and there was a Mongol ruler in China. Mongol Empire began in Mongolia and northern China in, in 1271. And in 1279, completely overthrew the Song Dynasty and established the Yuan Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty was the first non-Han Chinese dynasty to rule all of China. Uh, there's the uh, Kublai Khan. The Mongol emperors of the Yuan, some of them mastered the Chinese language. Others uh, continued to speak primarily Mongolian. But the Yuan Dynasty... Um, the rulers of the Yuan Dynasty were intensely interested in printing, in the printing industry. At this time, still chiefly block printing, although under the Song Dynasty, one of the accomplishments of the Song Dynasty was movable type. So there's some movable type going on in this period. But the Yuan Dynasty actually patronizes the uh, printing industry and created a government-sponsored printing office and established centers for printing uh, across, the, uh, across China so that in the late 13th and the early 14th century, uh, even private printing uh, businesses popped up uh, across China and flourished and printed a, 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 a diverse range of different texts, educational, religious, medical, literary, calendars, almanacs, you name it. And the Yuan Dynasty continued the Song Dynasty use of paper currency. Unlike the Song, however, the Yuan Dynasty decides upon a fiat currency, a fiat currency, which they called the Zhao Chao, Zhao Chao. And there it is. This is a Yuan note. There's the uh, the, um, the wood block that was used. At first, the Yuan uh, Dynasty used wood block printing, and then they switched over to bronze plates. But you'll notice on there, you see. Uh, strings of cash see the images there strings of cash noting that hey this is supposed to be this note is equal in value to so many strings of cash but it wasn't redeemable in strings of cash like it was under the song or like it was during the tang dynasty for private mer merchants it's not redeemable there's no office that you could go to and present a zhao chao note to receive an equivalent number of strings of cash as a fiat currency no commodity backing it is irredeemable or inconvertible there's no office that you can take it to and automatically receive by right a certain number of cash coins how did it have value? It's purely fiat. Remember the word fiat means by decree. It has value by decree. It doesn't have intrinsic value. It has extrinsic value. The value doesn't come from anything in and of itself, nor does it represent through convertibility anything that has value in and of itself. The value of the currency comes purely from an external or extrinsic decree. And that decree was a legal tender law. Legal, uh, the currency was declared legal tender for all public payments, taxes, fines, fees. And this is what gave the notes value in the market. So whenever it was time to pay taxes, you knew that you could that the Yuan Dynasty was obligated to accept this currency in payment of taxes. And so this gave it some value. In fact, you may, you could argue that instead of being redeemable in cash coins, it was redeemable for taxes. Um, 
nonetheless, uh, it is a fiat currency. And because of that, the currency suffered periodic bouts of inflation. Um, the temptation was there to overprint because it wasn't bound necessarily to any sort of redemp redemption. Uh, the Yuan government wasn't obligated to redeem it for a certain number of cash coins, despite the image printed on the note. So the world's, under Song Dynasty, the world's first government-issued paper currency under the Yuan Dynasty, the world's first fiat paper currency. Now you look at that Mongol Empire, you see it's not only China, but also Persia. Well, in 1294, the Mongol ruler of Persia was running into some financial trouble, wanted control of the treasury, and decided to copy the uh, paper money experiment and introdu introduced in Persia a new paper money. And he actually imitated the Chinese example or the Yuan example so closely that the paper money he issued actually had some Chinese characters on it. Uh, but to appease the local Muslim population, he also uh, uh, printed on the, on the bill uh, certain verses from the Quran and a, a Muslim confession of faith hoping that that would, that would appease the population. Population, however, was accustomed to silver coin. Here is a silver coin from the period. Now the Mongol ruler in Persia issued a decree that anyone who refused this new paper money, and it was a purely fiat paper money, anyone who refused this new fiat paper currency would uh, suffer execution. Quite the punishment. Uh, well, it was introduced, the experiment failed miserably and in fact in the marketplaces um, riots broke out and the merchants refused to accept them everyone just stood down and refused to accept the new notes the economic activity uh, came to a complete standstill the ruler was forced to withdraw abruptly the new paper money and he was assassinated shortly thereafter so a complete failure of paper money in Persia in China however it hangs around and uh, and, and that does not escape the notice, the persistence of paper money, does not escape the notice of the Europeans who through the travels of Marco Polo, the famous Italian explorer, um, find out if, uh, quite a few things about this Chinese paper money and other things about Oriental civilization. And in the year 1300, Marco Polo published his uh, travels of Marco Polo. And in it, you see he traveled through the, uh, across the ancient world there, along the Silk Road, and then, and then came back via the Indian uh, uh, South China Sea to the Arabian Sea. Well, in the travels of Marco Polo, he has a chapter, a section, Remember, the Yuan dynasty is, this, uh, is in control of China. How the great Khan causeth the bark of trees made into something like paper to pass for money all over his country. And if you were a European, you're like, whoa, what? <laughs> uh, what is this? Um, the bark of trees pass, passes for money in China? This is strange. Um, I, didn't, I for, forgot to mention this, but the... Uh, the paper money, the yuan uh, used the bark of mulberry trees to create their paper money. And this is what Marco Polo said. All these pieces of paper are issued with as much solemnity and authority as if they were of pure gold or silver. And indeed, everybody takes them readily. For wherever, wheresoever a person may go, he shall find these pieces of paper current and shall be able to transact all sales and purchases of goods by means of them just as well as if they were coins of pure gold. So Marco Polo was um, quite the admirer of, uh, of this paper currency. But again, imagine you're in Europe, uh, you hear of this going on, you also hear the maybe the failed experiment in Persia. Hmm, this is interesting. What's going on in China? Well, in 1368, a new dynasty uh, 
arises. Um, the Mongols have been overthrown in China. The Ming Dynasty, and this is the last Han Chinese dynasty over China. Uh, the Qing Dynasty, which followed the Ming, were a Manchu-led um, uh, dynasty. The Ming Dynasty, interestingly enough, uh, well, also continues as paper currency. The Ming Dynasty began their reign over China uh, as a world power, a major world power, commercial power. And actually, uh, it was under the Ming that an explorer, a Chinese explorer, Zheng He, made his famous voyages throughout the Indian Ocean. And I had this map in, in uh, part B of the lecture, but it's more appropriate here because it happened under the Ming. But Zheng He made seven different voyages into the Indian Ocean. More than 1,000 soldiers in, visited uh, India, East Africa, throughout the, Ara the Arabian Sea. And over the course of his nautical career, covered over 30,000 miles and actually uh, traveled in ships that were larger than uh, Columbus's ships when Columbus crossed the Atlantic Ocean. These were purely exploratory voyages and they were sponsored by the Ming Emperor. Um, so they were not commercial necessarily in, uh, in orientation. And here, uh, another image I had in lecture B, more appropriate here, a, a giraffe brought back to China. And actually, um, a few years ago in 2012, there was a, um, an excavation in Kenya. A discovery was made. And at this excavation in Kenya, a 600-year-old Chinese cash coin was found in Kenya. Isn't that, isn't that wild? A 600-year-old cash coin was found in Kenya because of, of, uh, of this, these exploratory ventures. Well, in 1424, the... Uh, the emperor, the Ming emperor who had sponsored Zheng He's voyages died and a new, more conservative Confucianist emperor assumed power. And for various reasons, he, he ended these exploratory voyages. For one thing, they were very costly uh, for the Chinese government that sponsored them. Um, and it was just not clear at the time that China really had any need to explore the Indian Ocean. Uh, China was fairly self-sufficient. And in the western parts of China, in Central Asia, the Ming were uh, faced with a number of uh, attacks um, by various Central Asian groups. And so the Ming turned inward. And actually the Ming emperor destroyed all the ships that were capable of long distance exploration and destroyed the written records that had been made uh, describing those voyages. And in fact, because of, the, because of that, uh, that destruction, we didn't even know until the 1930s the extent of uh, Zhang He's voyages. Anyway, I kind of went on a sidetrack there, but it's interesting. The Ming Dynasty had a uh, cash coin currency like all the other dynasties before them. I neglected to say, by, by the way, that Yuan also had used cash coins. Paper money never completely supplanted the use of cash coins. Cash coins continued through this entire period. So circulating side by side with paper money. But the Ming, like the Yuan, issue a fiat paper currency. And here's a Ming note. You'll notice it still has cash coins print strings of cash printed on the coin to serve as sort of the this is what the value is this is what the official exchange rate is even though it's completely irredeemable and was in fact a fiat currency well there's a um, the wood block of a Ming note. By the way, this is very interesting. Uh, this is at a, a museum in Tokyo. Here's a Ming note from the period. Um, look at the size of that note relative to these dollar bills. Isn't that interesting? These are very large notes. These were not notes that any of us would be able to fit in our wallets. 
just a, 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 a pretty uh, fairly uh, curious side note there about the, the the size of these notes. Well, the Ming Dynasty. Part of the reason why they ended these exploratory ventures was they faced um, many fiscal problems. And oftentimes when a government faces fiscal problems, especially when they have the ability to print paper currency, they overprint paper currency. And in the late 14th centuries and in the early 15th, in the late 14th and early 15th centuries, the Ming Dynasty overprinted its paper currency and hyperinflation set in and really got bad around the mid middle of the 15th century. Hyperinflation collapse in the value of paper money. So the paper money was becoming more and more worthless. As the paper money became worthless, the Chinese people independently of the, of the state sort of spontaneously and, and gradually converged upon silver currency. The Ming didn't create a silver coin. There was no silver coinage issued by the Ming. And so the Chinese people decided to adopt um, silver bullion, silver bars. Here are some silver bars from this period, and you'll note on there uh, that there are um, Chinese markings made on those silver bars, denoting how much these silver bars weigh, issued by China, uh, private Chinese merchants. And they also used Spanish silver dollars. Now, how in the world are Spanish silver dollars, Spanish silver coins making their way all the way over to China. Well, uh, we'll see why in a few lectures, but this um, process of what, what some historians have called the silverization, the silverization of China. China in the 15th and 16th centuries latches onto silver, the Chinese people that is, not the state. The state resists the move to silver. State doesn't want silver. There's not that many silver mines in China, but the Chinese people reject the paper currency independently reject the paper currency, which is hyperinflated and latch on to a silver currency. And it will have major, major, I can't actually, I can't overstate, overstate that major consequences for the global trading system. This adoption of silver in China right around the same time that the Spanish conquer the Americas and uncover silver mines, the likes of which have never been seen in world history. So, uh, but that is yet to come uh, for now. Thank you for uh, watching the, these, uh, this lecture seven, and I will see you next time.